<laughs> all right, good morning, everybody. Hey, it's very good to see you all here today in the Lord's house and uh, ready to go. And hopefully you've got your Bibles turned open to uh, Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, I'm looking forward to going through Hebrews. I was uh, praying about what to preach on and, uh, you know, I've, I've found that I haven't really preached on, out of Hebrews for about four years. And so uh, Hebrews is one of those passages uh, that you guys, you have to get to every few years uh, because it is so important and integral to our faith and helping us to understand uh, what our faith is all about and uh, the important aspects of our faith. And so uh, I wanted to uh, go through, for the next few weeks anyway, go through uh, the, uh, the book of Hebrews and uh, highlight some of the very, very important things uh, out it. I do want to say what a treat it was to have the uh, Jarden girls uh, with us and singing today. And it just uh, thrills my heart when I see Emily and she's ready to go to college. And um, I know that you're going to do well down there. And the church is a good church that you're going to go to. And I just enjoy singing, uh, having all three of those girls singing uh, songs to us occasionally and so uh, what a what a privilege that was and I enjoyed the song too what a beautiful song that was so thank you all for doing that um, also um, I am looking forward very much uh, just encouraging my heart uh, thinking about uh, at 445 I'm loading the bus and uh, I'm getting on it and I'm going to go to a gospel concert uh, quartet uh, down at uh, Overland Park Baptist Temple I'm going and if you have time and you want to go too, you can follow the bus uh, or you can find out uh, the address. I'd be happy to give you the address. But um, Brother um, Roby, is, Tracy Roby is a good friend of mine and, and uh, we do all of our um, junior camps together at uh, Amazing Grace Baptist Camp. And uh, Tracy Roby is a great, wonderful man of God. So when I got the uh, invitation, he says, if you want to invite your folks and come out on Sunday night to a, a gospel quartet that we're having, come on out. So I said, hey, you don't have to ask me twice, I'm, we're in. And so uh, if you have a little time this afternoon and, and you enjoy that kind of stuff, I love a good uh, quartet, and uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It'll be a good time of fellowship as well. So uh, if you can be a part of that, that would be good. And so uh, today we're going to be uh, in the book of Hebrews. Well, it is a joy to have every one of you here today. And uh, I pray that as we crack open the word of God and looking forward to it, uh, that we can learn a little something that's important to us. And so uh, I hope that your heart and your mind is ready uh, to hear what God has to say out of Hebrews chapter 1 as he establishes Jesus Christ as the most important thing, communicating that Christ is the, uh, the way, the truth, and the life and communicating the importance of Jesus Christ. And he really establishes that in the book of Hebrews. And so uh, looking forward to getting down to it. So God bless you for being here. Let's all bow for prayer and we'll ask the Lord to bless our service. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much for the day today. And of course, at this moment, we pray for your spirit to, to guide us and direct us. Father, would you comfort our hearts that uh, we, in terms of uh, a belief system, Lord, the idea of is Jesus Christ really what we should be trusting in? Uh, you kind of put that to rest when we read Hebrews chapter 1. So, Father, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word. And I pray, Lord, we, uh, I, I believe that we have some folks that are seeking today spiritual uh, understanding. And, uh, Father, there are some that uh, possibly are wondering what Jesus Christ, who Christ is, and... and um, what kind of an impact Christ has in my life? What are my responsibilities to Christ? And uh, I pray that in the next few weeks, we'll be able to really establish that uh, Jesus Christ is uh, the plan for all of mankind and that we must have a relationship with him. He that believeth on the Son hath life. He that believeth not hath not life. And so, Father, help us to understand that uh, Jesus is your gift to mankind and that we are to place our full faith and trust in him. We are to come to Christ for forgiveness of sins. We are to come to Jesus Christ for the <clears throat> salvation that allows us to have eternal life. We are to come to Christ even after that for every day of our life to uh, receive sustenance, uh, to receive power, to receive uh, fellowship uh, with Jesus Christ each and every day. If that is your will, 
dear Father. And so I pray, Lord, that we'd be able to expound on that today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we even ask these things in his name. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, turn over to Hebrews chapter 1. I just want to do a couple of verses, if I could, uh, this morning. Uh, Let's just do uh, the first three verses. I think that would be sufficient. Uh, You can read all of Hebrews chapter 1. It's only 14 verses, uh, but uh, I want you to understand that he's about to lift up uh, Jesus Christ who we worship. God who at sundry times and divers manners. Sundry times, divers manners just means various times in various manners or various ways and at different times God spoke to us God spoke to us in time past unto the fathers by the prophets that's how he communicated to us verse 2 but something's changed verse 2 he hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds then if you were to look down at verse number 3 who being who Jesus being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins. He's the one. You want forgiveness of sins? You want your sins to be taken care of? He's the one who purges our sins. And after he did what it took to purge our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high because he was tired. No, it's not because he was tired. Uh, This is not an indication that he was tired. It's an indication of the finality that he finished his business of what he came to do. And for us to understand what that is, is very important. And so if I were to pick up the Bible here today, and let's just start at the beginning, verse number one, and I were to say uh, these words, God has spoken to us. You know, from the moment of creation all the way into present day, God created us. He's never left mankind. I I am not a deist. Uh, I am not one that thinks that he just kind of like a couple pieces of dice. He kind of threw the world out there and said, hey, let's see what happens here. That is not what I am. That is not what the word of God teaches. The truth of the matter is he, 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 he created us and he cares about his creation. He's going somewhere. It's not for his pleasure that he just wants to see us, um, you know, suffer and go through life. He has a plan. He says, hey, I created you, and I created you, and I created you, and I've got a plan for your lives. I'm taking you someplace, and I want to do something. Truth of the matter is, is that he has a plan for our lives, and he's communicated with us the whole way through. So every step of the way, God has communicated to us, and he's done it in different ways, such as Hebrews chapter 1 says, at various times, in, some, in different manners, God has communicated to us his will. Before Christ came, he, he, he uh, communicated to us via the prophets. So he would have chosen men and sometimes women uh, that he would choose to speak to us and help us to understand this is the direction God is going. And so God has spoken to us uh, through his prophets. Sometimes God has spoken to us directly. And sometimes God has actually come down, such as when he spoke to Moses in the, uh, the bush. Let me give you a few. He spoke to Moses on, in, at the bush. Uh, he spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai uh, in thunderings and lightnings in the voice of the trumpet. And uh, for the children of Israel that were down off of Mount Sinai, they saw the lightning and the thundering and, and God speaking in this, uh, this type of a way. And it was uh, terrifying to the children of Israel. And then, of course, when Moses came down, of course, he had the Shekinah glory on him. Scripture talks about this in the Old Testament, how that they were like, could you put a towel over your face? And we talked about that a few weeks ago. Uh, We just, you know, you're kind of shining. You're glowing a little bit, and uh, it's messing with us. You know what? That's when God spoke to uh, Moses. And, of course, we know the Jewish people uh, uh, commemorate the, uh, the importance of Moses in their heritage as well. And then, of course, uh, God spoke to Elijah personally on uh, Mount Horeb. In a still, small voice, he spoke to him. God has spoken to people all through the scriptures, and we see it throughout scriptures, is God speaking to people. He spoke to Daniel through dreams. He spoke to Ezekiel through great, uh, glorious and mighty visions. He spoke to Abraham uh, 
Genesis chapter 12, in a human form, uh, at times God would actually come in human form and speak to him and say, hey, Isaac is on his way. Hey, I'm 75. Hey, I'm 85. Hey, I'm 95. Hey, I'm 99 years old. Isaac is on his way. And God would speak to him in different ways. And really neat stories that we enjoy reading out of uh, the word of God. God spoke to uh, Jacob in a very interesting way, in an angelic form. And we understand he wrestled with him a little bit. And so um, he spoke to Jacob uh, in, in uh, dreams and visions as well. Does God speak to his people? Yes. He's not one to just say, hey, I, I've created you and I'm never going to speak to you again. No, he has always, through, from the beginning of time that we can see, Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 15, uh, God spoke to uh, Adam the first time. Uh, he spoke to Adam in terms of the fact that a Messiah is coming. And that's what I want to say is that God has spoken to his children uh, in many different ways in many different times. Giving them the law, giving them solemn warnings, giving them divine exhortation. I was reading a little bit of uh, Oliver B. Green, who is a uh, really easy commentary to, re to read, and I really enjoy him. He, he chimed in on this idea of the fact that God spoke to us. Uh, out of verse number one here, he writes, um, God has warned and admonished in type, in parable, in, shout, in shadows, but regardless of how or to whom he appeared, it was always the same word, the word of Almighty God. Even though that word came in, to men in various forms, in various ways, whether in a still small voice or in a mighty thunder on Sinai, it was the great I am uh, who spoke. Oliver B. Greenroot, that I, I like that. And that's true. God has spoken to men, mankind throughout all of the years in different ways, in different forms, but God has always spoken to us. And it's recorded in the Word of God uh, that He has spoken to us. One of the main messages that God has spoken, starting in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15, is the idea that I am going to come and visit you with the Christ. A Messiah is coming that is going to solve the problems of sin and the problems of mankind. All the way at the very beginning of the book, he said, I'm going to send a Messiah. And, and uh, to Adam, he said, I will put enmity between thee, and he said this to the serpent, I'm going to put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It, the son of the woman, which is Jesus, shall bruise thy head and he shall bruise thy heel, his heel, right, on the cross. It's, it's, it's a mention, Scott, biblical scholars say, that this is a mention of the cross of Christ, mentioned all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 15. When Abraham finally came around in Genesis chapter 12, uh, God said, hey, listen, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm sending somebody. And, and we find through other scriptures, it is the Christ, the Messiah is coming. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1. Now the Lord uh, had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. We know that about Abraham. And I will make of thee a great nation. In other words, you're going to have a child. And that child is going to have a bunch of kids. And those kids are going to have a bunch of people. And you're going to have a great nation in your heritage. He says, And I will bless, and I will make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. In other words, somewhere along the line of your lineage, someone is coming along that will do something that will be a blessing to not just the Jews, but to all of the Jews and all of the Gentiles. Biblical scholars tell us that this is a reference to the Messiah, to the coming Christ. And so God speaks to us, and one of the main things that he has spoken to us is one of the main messages from Genesis all the way through is that a Christ is coming, a Messiah is coming. He told Ab Adam, he told Abraham, he told Jacob, which is a descendant of, we have Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. Jacob had the 12 sons, which are the 12 tribes of Israel, as we know. And he told Jacob that this Christ would come through one of his sons. He said, matter of fact, I'll tell you which son it will be. It'll be through the tribe of Judah. Your son Judah, that's who this Christ will come through. Genesis 49, verse number 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. 
nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the uh, gathering of the people be. Unto him, unto this son of yours, unto a descendant of Judah, one day all of the people will be gathered unto him. And this is another reference uh, to Jesus Christ as well. God told, the, uh, told David that Christ would be in his lineage. Not only Judah, well, David is in the lineage of Judah. And he told David, you're not him, but it's going to come through your, your uh, children, through your lineage. Psalm 132, verse number 11. The Lord has sworn in truth unto David. He said, I promise, I promise, I promise. He will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. Through your children, I'm going to set upon the throne forever and ever and ever. God spoke to Micah that uh, Christ would, one of the minor prophets that we find in Scripture, wrote the book of Micah, of course, uh, that he would be born in a little obscure town called Bethlehem. God said, hey, I just want to let you know, heads up, uh, this Christ that I've been speaking through and about through Adam and Abraham and Jacob and all of these others, and the psalmist, he said, it's actually, he's actually going to be born in the city of Bethlehem. Micah chapter 5, verse number 2. But thou, Bethlehem, though thou be little amongst the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler in Israel. I'm going to do it through... Uh, see, God has spoke uh, through the hundreds and thousands of years. God spoke to this individual and this individual and this individual. A Christ is coming. A Messiah is coming. In Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi was told that Christ would, be the fore, would have a forerunner. That b just before the Christ that, it, that is supposed to come, he's going to have a forerunner. And essentially, he is going to be the Patrick Henry... He is going to be the, uh, the guy, who was the guy running around saying the British are coming, the British are coming? Huh? Paul Revere? Okay. Uh, John the Baptist is the Paul Revere uh, of the Christ. I just made up that illustration. I usually, uh, things go bad when I make up illustrations immediately. But anyway, you get the idea. And that's what John was saying. There's coming a Christ. He's coming. He's coming. And uh, so God said, I'm going to give you some specificity. There's going to be a forerunner just before Christ comes. And we know that John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ. He must increase, I must decrease, is what he told his disciples. Here he is. And as soon as John uh, the Baptist sees the Christ, he looks upon him coming up over a hill, as it says in the book of John. He says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And so we have a forerunner. And God said, Hey, I just want to let you know that I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before thee, and um, it, it will happen. Uh, one of the most amazing things that God communicated to us was a time frame in which he would come. Now, Daniel and the Lord were very close, and God spoke to Daniel through dreams. And one of the things, you read uh, 12 chapters in the book of Daniel, it's a prophetic book. The first six are narrative. Chapter 7 through 12 is prophetic. Chapter 1 through 6 is pretty easy to understand. Chapter 7 through 12 is a little bit more difficult to understand. But in chapter 9, there is a reference that is fairly clear. And that is, uh, this is where he speaks of the 70th week of Daniel. Now, this is a little bit difficult. And you say, well, I've heard of the 70 weeks of Daniel. Some of you might say, I have no idea what the 70 weeks of Daniel are all about. Anyway, it's a prophetic uh, deal that... Um, Daniel explains and he writes about. Now, we look at 70 weeks. We look at 70 weeks where there's seven weeks, seven days in each week. The 70 weeks of Daniel are a little different. Each week is seven years. And so you have seven years times 70 of those. Seven times seven is 490. So we're looking at a period of 490. Well, Daniel says that from a certain time period to a certain time period, the Christ is going to be finishing his work. So now we have a time period. I love prophecy, but many of, much of prophecy is kind of general in nature. One of the most miraculous things in all of Scripture, if you look at the top three prophecies, what Daniel spoke of, what God gave him the insight to, is one of the most amazing things. Because 
we look at 70 weeks, 490 years, it's actually divided in two sections. One is a very heavy section where you have 69 of those weeks, and then you have the last seven years. And so as we look at prophecy and how it uh, comes about, we look that he says we're going to have 69 weeks, and then there's going to be a big who knows how, long, how many years in between, and then we'll finish up with the last seven or, or the last week, which is seven more years. So those of you who are familiar with prophecy, you say, okay, so if we have 490 years, you take off seven, that's 483 years. So what's he say? Well, Daniel says in Daniel chapter uh, 9 and verse number 26, that after 69 weeks, the, this is what it says, the Messiah, and he uses the word Messiah here specifically, the Messiah will be cut off. Interesting. And what, what is it speaking of? It is speaking of the death of Jesus Christ. Now, you can Google this, and there's some, some guys that have done some really interesting down to the date, okay? Uh, I don't know that I, I would go that far, but uh, the, it's miraculous enough to realize that from the moment where Artaxerxes, and this is a historical document that's well documented, Artaxerxes was over Israel. Israel was in captivity, by the way. I mean, they, they weren't of their own. They were, they were in captivity. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar passes away, and then uh, the Medes and the Persians take over. And I don't have to give you the whole, um, the whole story, but essentially a king comes up that says, what are all these people doing? Why don't we just start letting them go back home to Jerusalem? The moment that Artaxerxes in 444 BC, before Christ, 444 years before Christ, Artaxerxes gives the decree for Jerusalem to be rebuilt, for the wall to be rebuilt, for the temple to be rebuilt. And so uh, as things began to, to work, the decree came in 444 BC. Now, if you were to take the, the life of Christ as well and add the 444 years, add that to that, and um, uh, uh, be able to uh, add those things to it, we find that 483 years uh, comes into play where Christ is actually being crucified on the 483rd year. He is indeed cut off. Now, uh, I'm not an expert at any of this stuff either, but uh, I do enjoy the fact that this has been looked at uh, very carefully, and uh, it is one of the biggest, most hum unbelievable miracles in all of scripture for Daniel to write these words and for them historically to be accomplished in 483 years that Christ was hanging upon the cross. It is truly amazing. And it's a testament that God was speaking to people. And he says, and one of the ways that he spoke and one of the messages he spoke is I have a Christ that is coming. A Messiah is on his way. And uh, sp the the specifics are tremendous. In others, uh, Zechariah, one of the big things that we notate from the book of Zechariah, chapter 11, verse 13, is that Zechariah began speaking of this Messiah as well and that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Now, this is over 400 years. There are 400 years of silence between Old Testament and New Testament. Just to let you know, 400 years where nobody said anything. There is no minor prophet. There is no major prophet. Nothing for 400 years. So Zechariah was writing 400 years before Christ, at least, and he said that the Messiah would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And, of course, we know that that was indeed fulfilled. Was God speaking to us about the Christ? Yes, he was. In, uh, to Zechariah, to a, a lot of others. In, in Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah was told, he will be wounded for your transgressions. This is where the sin of mankind comes in. Why is he sending this Christ? Why is he sending this? So we can make him the king? No, not necessarily. He will be wounded for our transgressions. He will be bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we will be healed. So it is through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, through the beating, through the stripes, through the, uh, the idea of, uh, of uh, what he had to go through, that's how we uh, find forgiveness of our sins. And this is the reason why Christ was, 
was brought. No accident that he found himself on the cross. He wasn't overwhelmed and surprised by it. He came down on the cross for the purpose of taking the sins of the world upon him, that by his stripes we can be healed. You can find forgiveness of sins because he died on a cross. There are so many people that wear a necklace with a cross on it, and they have no idea what the significance of that cross means. This means freedom. This means I can be set free from my sins. This is why Christ came. This is the message of Christianity. This past week, we uh, had the, uh, our old church over there had some foundation problems. And um, we uh, uh, took off all of the... Um, we didn't know it had foundation problems. We found that it had uh, a little bit of a problem with the uh, MLS, a mold-like substance. I don't know what that is, but anyway. Uh, we took off all of the... Uh, all of the paneling is gone. All of you old people that uh, have been with us long enough to have remember the days over at the old, we have our uh, potlucks down there. Uh, there's a little bit of, there was a little MLS uh, down at the bottom. And uh, so uh, we said, no problem. And uh, we'll, we'll take it all out. And so we took off all of the paneling. We took off all of the drywall. And uh, it just it, uh, went all the way down to the studs. And then you can see the, the foundation and how that it was cracked uh, for 60 feet. There was a horizontal crack to that. And uh, I did one of those moments. And, um, but uh, we made a few phone calls, got a contractor in there, uh, got the, the engineered fix uh, for the situation. So it's a safe building for the preschool who's about to buy the building. And uh, wonderful. And the guy who fixed it, he ended up digging all along the foundation and uh, uncovered everything so that he could do a proper fix to this thing. And I've never seen the foundation of the building. And uh, I thought that was really cool. But then he dug down a little deeper and uh, there is a footing that is poured that the foundation is on. And I say all of that to say this, to give you a little bit of a picture. You know, in terms of our church, uh, you say, well, you may know what our church is and what it stands for and the message of the, the church. Well, you may see the, the, uh, the walls and the roof and everything, but that's not really uh, where it really gets down to. You may say, well, I can see a little bit of the foundation wall there too. That's really not what our church is based on. You get down below the, the building, you get down below the foundation walls, and all the way at the bottom is this uh, little thing. If you're a builder, you know that the first thing you have to do is you have to pour this little thing that's about 24 inches wide, and it's a little about a foot deep or so, and you pour it all the way around where you're going to put your foundation, and this is called the footer. This is called the thing that everything rests on. It doesn't all rest on the foundation walls. It all actually rests upon the footer. If you want to know what the footer of Lighthouse Baptist Church is, the footer is Jesus Christ. He is everything. He is, he is a, I can't express it more. He is everything to us. And if you have him, you have life. If you have not Christ living within you, then you haven't even really accomplished anything. You have to have Christ living within you because he is the footer upon which all of Christendom sits upon. It is through Christ and Christ alone. And so has God spoken to us? Yes, he has. He's uh, told the psalmist, he said, this is my son, uh, the, the Christ is going to come and here's how he's going to die. He has pierced my uh, Psalm uh, 22, verse number 16 says, They pierced my hands and my feet. The, God told the psalmist that Christ would rise again um, in Psalm 16, and verse number 10. All through the Old Testament, you find that God has communicated to mankind the importance and the coming of Jesus Christ. And so he has spoken to us of Christ, the work of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, the leadership of Christ, the necessity of Christ and what he was going to accomplish. And then once Christ came, God said this in Hebrews chapter one, he said, this is my son, and from now on, I'm speaking through my son. You listen to every word that he says. So we look in our text here today, and we understand the importance. God, who at sundry times, and in divers manners, various times, various manners, spoke to us unto the fathers 
uh, by the prophets hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he made the worlds. And so now it is through Christ and Christ alone. So God's current message to us is that from now on, I will speak to you through my son. The eventual plan of God has always been to speak through the son of God, the, your need of the son of God. All of the plans for mankind, you'll be able to find it through the words of Jesus Christ. All of my, uh, your future is found in Jesus Christ. All of your hope is found in Jesus Christ. All of your purpose for life. Why in the world am I even here? Listen to what Christ has to say, because he's the one who has the answer for you in that regard. And so we uh, look and we say, listen, uh, Hebrews makes it very clear that you must have Jesus Christ. He's the one who represents God. He is the creator of the world. He is the heir of all things. He is actually God in flesh. Look in our text in verse number three. Who, Jesus, being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, of his father. He is the image of his father upholding all things by the world by by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of majesty so because jesus is the son of god who takes away the sins of the world john chapter 1 verse number 29 the forerunner has said it in john 1 29 john the baptist says behold the lamb of god which taketh away the sin of the world Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 2, verse number 6, As ye therefore have received Christ the Lord, so walk in him. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he made alive, quickened together with him, and forgiven you all trespasses. This is what he does. And this is what he has done uh, for you and I. And so in conclusion here today, I just want to let you know that uh, Jesus is all that we need. He is the one who can forgive you of your sins. In Luke chapter 7, verse number 48, Jesus healed a woman uh, that had uh, been bowing down before him. And uh, he looked at her and said, thy sins be forgiven thee. She was a sinful woman, the scriptures say. And Jesus looked at her and said, thy sins be forgiven. All the Pharisees looked at him and said, who gave you the authority to forgive sins? Little did they know that God had been saying for a long time that his son would come and he would have the ability to purge the sins of the world. And that's what Jesus Christ had the authority to do. Did he do it? Yes, he did. Does he do it today? Yes, he does. Jesus offers us forgiveness of sins. He offers us eternal life through salvation. And Jesus, by the way, is the only uh, way as well. There is no other way available. One of the strong messages of our church has to be, is, and will always be, God willing, will always be that Christ is supreme, he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man cometh unto the Father but by him, John 14, 6. He's the only way. I can't tell you that there's, you can go this way, and you can go that way, and you can do this, or you can do that. Actually, Scripture makes it very clear. He's the only way that God has made available so that we might have eternal life. There is no other way. John 14, 6, Acts 4, 12. There, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is only through Christ. I can't offer you any hope through um, Buddhism. I can't help you through, I, I have no hope for you whatsoever, scripturally speaking. Even though you're a good person, and I understand there's certain moral aspects of, of Hinduism, of uh, the Baha'i, uh, of, uh, of the Muslim faith, etc. There are certain good moral uh, aspects of certain, these kind of things. Here's what I say. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not eternal life. John 3, verse 36. Mark it down. I don't know if I believe this guy. Uh, believe me. John 3, 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him, because he hath not the Son. God is offering his Son. He's offering a way for us to have escape of sin and forgiveness of sin and allowing us to be one of his children by accepting him, receiving him, uh, 
communicating our faith to him. I like the idea of expressing our faith. We're supposed to believe in him. It's one thing to say, well, I believe that Jesus is God. Great, I'm, I'm there. Well, it's good for us to express that, that uh, belief by saying, Lord, I, I believe that you are the Son of God, and that I believe that you can take away my sins, and now I'm asking you to forgive me of our, my sins, and I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins, and I'm asking you to save my soul. This is the message that I speak to you privately in your house. This is the message that I want to preach from this pulpit this is the message, the foundation, the footer. Forget the house. Forget the basement. Uh, go all the way down to the footer. This is the message of Lighthouse Baptist Church. You've got to have Christ. And you've got to express this and say, I need you for forgiveness and I need you for salvation. I need you in my life from that moment forward. I need you. I need you. I can't do it without you. And when we place our faith and our trust in him, then Christ, we, are, we receive Christ into our life. I believe that, uh, you know, Revelation 3.20, uh, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. What a wonderful picture of what Christ does for us, even at the moment of salvation. And I know Revelation 3 is talking to the church at Laodicea, but I think that this is a wonderful principle of how God works. He doesn't make you accept him as Savior. He is calling to you. My Bible says Jesus calls to us. He says, <clears throat> come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It doesn't say I'm going to come and blow your doors down and I'm going to make you accept me. I guess this is the design of creation is that I'm going to make it available to you and then I will give it to you if you reach out and you take it. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When an elderly lady led me to Christ, she mentioned the scripture, and she said, if I had a box with a gift and a bow, and I were to, leave, and, and I were to hold it out to you, it, does it belong to you? And the answer is, no, it doesn't belong to me. When does it belong to you? When I receive it, when I take it, and I receive it to myself. That's when the gift belongs to me. Same way it is with Scripture. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to be the sons of God. And so uh, we are to express this faith in him. And uh, I, I think that it is a uh, wonderful thing that we are to do. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God... There is one mediator between God and men, and that is the man Christ Jesus. That's what it says. There is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. You don't come to me. We're not one of those kind of churches where uh, I can save you. I can't do anything for you. I'd be happy to kneel down with you and lead you in a prayer that would uh, lead you to salvation. But it, don't think that it's anything I said because I, I have nothing to offer you. I am lost out in the sea. I, 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 am, uh, just, I, I am a sinner saved by grace just like anybody else. I can tell you how that one day I lifted up my hand in the ocean that I was treading water in and destined to die in. And how that Christ came and reached down and saved me, pulled me in. That's all I can do is tell you how I got saved. And uh, I just wish the same for you. I don't have a boat. I'm sitting in Christ's boat and he's the one who saved me. Uh, so I, don't, I can't offer you any forgiveness. I'm never going to sit on the other side of a little box someplace and say um, your, your sins are absolved or whatever. And I'm, I'm not making fun of anybody. But uh, the, my Bible says there is one mediator between God and men. And that is Christ Jesus, the foundation of who we are. And so I have nothing to offer you except I can point my finger and say that's the way to salvation. Go to Christ. That's all I can offer you. He's the one with the power. He's the one who died on a cross. He's the one who bled. He's the one who rose again. He's the one who sits at the right hand of the Father, as our Hebrews chapter 1 says. He's the one to go to for the answers in your life. And so this is the message. And this is, and I, I, I want to get all of the verses that I got down here. So I, 2 Timothy 2, 5. One God, one mediator between God and man, the, the man Christ Jesus. 1 John 5, 11. Beautiful, so clear. And this is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. For he that hath the Son hath life, he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And so um, these are the last days, by the way. 
I like what he says in our text, and I've meditated on that a little bit. Verse 2 says, and in these last days, he has spoken to us. You know what that says to me? In verse 3, it says that he sat down. It means there's a finality. These are the last days. There's no one else coming. There's no other message that's coming. There's no other person that's coming that's going to have anything different to offer you. And in terms of what God feels and what, what God is communicating to us, he said, this is it. There is nothing else coming. So you can either accept this or reject it, you know, and you have the, you have the volitional will to do what you want to do. And so his children will look at you and say, please accept him. He, he is the Christ, and it, he is who he says he is. And so these are the last days. And so uh, verse number three says, Who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. This is the plan of God. And so we will always speak of Christ, and we will always tell people uh, that they need Christ. In the last m- month or two, I, I visited with people, and I tell them, this is the gospel. This is, this is the plan that God has, is that we are to go to Christ, and we are to ask for forgiveness of sins. We are to go to him for salvation. And any person that I meet, whether it's somebody that visits our church or if it's somebody that comes in, uh, Mary is sitting back there uh, in that seat right there, Yesterday, at about, uh, about this time, a, a drifter was sitting right where you're sitting. And he was hot, and he'd been uh, walking out in the elements uh, for many days. And he had his duffel bag, and this is all of his worldly possessions. And he was sitting right there. And I was sitting in the seat next to him, and I was waiting, and we were about to take him and, and give him a night at a hotel in Lawrence, as he's headed up to Seneca and Washington and Concordia. And I said, well, you probably need to go to Lawrence and then from Lawrence go to Topeka and then from Topeka go north. And we looked at it on the map and he knows some people up there. And I said, we'd be happy to help you. And um, he said, you know, I've been out in the elements a long time. I was wondering if if there's any way uh, that you could help me with a hotel room, a motel. I said, yeah, we can do that. And um, we uh, went to Lawrence and and uh, found a restaurant, and I said, have you eaten lately? He goes, no, not for a long time. And so we pulled over at a restaurant, got him a little food and that kind of thing. But uh, as we were waiting to leave, and he was sitting there, and I was sitting right next to him, the, the Spirit of God moves upon me to say, I wonder if he has Christ. That's If I'm only going to meet you for just a, a moment in time, and tomorrow you're gone, and I'll probably never, ever see you again, I just want to let you know that on the heart of most of God's children, the thing that they're wondering, get all the way down through the facade of all everything, the foundation, the footer of everything is, I wonder if you have Christ. And so you start talking about Jesus Christ and have you ever uh, met Christ? Have you ever had a moment with Christ where you've prayed to him and, and asked him for forgiveness of sins and salvation? Have you ever done that? And I was thankful that he had a testimony of salvation anyway and uh, said that uh, he had and uh, in his travels uh, been introduced to Christ in a Baptist church someplace. He said he was in a Presbyterian church and they made him get saved again. So, <laughs> so but uh, he said uh, through a few of the churches that he's been in, See, we have a wanderer that just comes in, and I don't care if it's in the Baptist church here or a Baptist church in Kentucky or the Presbyterian church in Missouri that he went to. Uh, almost everywhere you go, if, you have, if you're a child of God and you see somebody like that, you're saying, are you saved? Have you have God, do you have Christ? And that's what I want to know. And so I felt pretty assured that at least he knows the message and he has, made, and he has a testimony that he was saved. And I'm thrilled with that. Because I realize he has no other hope in life unless he has Christ as his Lord and Savior. And so um, if you were to knock on our door, if you were to ring the doorbell, if you were to come in and visit one week, or if you're a returning visitor and uh, have had the opportunity to, to talk to you in at any way, if you're somebody like a month ago when somebody called me at midnight, woke me out of a good sleep and said, I just need to meet with you, 
I'm happy to talk to you on the phone and I'm happy to meet with you, but I'll guarantee you it's not going to be very long until we start talking about do you have Christ. So whether or not you uh, call or, or if you're a friend, you know, I have a lot of folks that I consider to be friends. I'm friends with. And they're good people. And I'm, I'm thrilled to know them. I'm thrilled to get to know them. And I'm thrilled about all of that. But my whole question to you is, is, do you have Christ as your Lord and Savior? And that's the most important thing. You see, this room is filled with most, a lot of people who look back in your life and you say, I remember the day I was introduced to Jesus Christ. I remember the person and the moment where I was encouraged to confess my sins to him and to call upon him for salvation. I remember that day. And for some of you, I enjoy, I've enjoyed hearing many of your testimonies, how that that was a life-altering moment in your life. Amen? And I'm thankful for that. But, you know, there are some people that are seeking and they're wondering and they're saying this is, uh, this is something that uh, I'm not sure about. Well, this is the message that we find from Scripture as honestly as we can possibly give it. This is what you need. You need Jesus Christ. And there is nothing below this. It's dirt below this, okay? Below the foundation of this church, there ain't nothing left. This is the beginning, is Jesus Christ. So I have to conclude the service today by asking you, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Has he forgiven you of your sins and have you asked him, have you received him like a gift that's being given? Have you looked at Christ and said, I want to receive you as my Lord? And I ask you into my heart today, would you save me from my sins? Would you save me, save my soul so that I have the gift of eternal life? Nothing would make anyone in this room happier. No one would be happier than me that if you would bow your head today and you would ask Jesus Christ to come in and be the Lord and Savior of your life. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand here this morning. With heads bowed and eyes closed today, we take just a moment for invitation time. And with your heads bowed and eyes closed today, I just hope that you are willing to examine your heart and your life. And I want to ask you the question, do you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Has he forgiven you? And I'm not asking, have you turned to him in a moment of, of distress? That's not what we're asking today. I'm not asking if you've uh, had a religious moment at a, at a time or two and say, well, that was a significant moment for me and he helped me through that. It's not what I'm asking. I'm asking, have you had a moment with Jesus Christ where he has forgiven you and you have accepted him as Lord and Savior of your life? If you're here this morning and you have had a moment where you re recall clearly the moment that Jesus came into your heart and your life, would you signify today by raising of your hand and say, yes, I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. All over the room, thank you. God bless you, yes. Look at all those hands, amen. I know that Jesus Christ is inside of me and has forgiven me of my sins, amen. Thank you, you can put your hands down. You know, with every head bowed and every eye closed today, I wonder if there's just one individual that might say in their heart, you know, I know that I have questions about this. I know that I want Jesus to come in my heart. I know I want him to forgive me of my sins. I want to have this moment that you're speaking of that it seems that so many people have had. Well, can I tell you something this morning? You can have that moment right now if you're serious before the Lord. You can do this. And yet it's so simple that a child can do it. And I love the fact that Christ made salvation so simple. With your head bowed and your eye closed, would you call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ today? Would you bow before him and say, Dear Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that the scriptures say, without you, I, I'm not saved. And so I bow before you today and I say, I believe that you have the power to forgive me of all my sins right now. And say, dear Jesus, I come to you and I ask you to please forgive me of every sin that I've ever committed. I lay them all before your feet today. 
and I confess that I am a sinner and I need you to save me. So dear Jesus, would you forgive me of my sins? Dear Jesus, dear Son of God, would you give me the gift of salvation today? I ask you to save my soul. I receive the gift. I'm holding out my hands and I want to receive salvation. Would you come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior? Would you ask him that today? Pray that prayer. Ask him to come in and be your Lord and Savior. You see, the scriptures say with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And that's what you need to do. Say, dear Jesus, please save my soul. Be the savior of my life. I give you everything. I give you my life. I give you my sins. I give it all to you. I just want to be your child. I want to be saved. And I come to you by faith, believing that you will do that. Oh, Father in heaven, I pray that all over this room, there are people that are, who, the, those who are wondering whether or not they're saved, I pray that they would pray a prayer like that honestly before you. Oh, Father, would you help them to call on your name and receive forgiveness, receive for salvation. And I pray you'd give it to them. Even now, right now, Oh, Father, thank you, Lord, for hearing these prayers. Thank you, Father, for hearing my prayer so many years ago. Thank you for salvation being free and something that lasts forever. I pray that there might be someone here today that realizes this is your moment. I remember when I asked Christ to forgive me. I remember when I believed in him for salvation. I was in a service and I was standing there and I was praying and I was bowing and I asked Jesus to be my savior and I asked him into my heart and it's changed my life from that moment forward. Oh, Father in heaven, I pray that there might be some testimony today of someone that's come to salvation, even in a service like this. Father, I pray that you would bless them today. Amen. That's what Christ is saying. Come home. Come to me. Ye who are weary, come home. This is the spiritual moment that you've needed all your life. This is the beginning. Accept it, it's free. For by grace are you saved. You say, I don't deserve it. I know, neither did I. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You mean I don't have to change my life? I don't have to, the changing of your life will come later. Salvation is free. Accept that salvation by grace. Grace is something that I don't deserve, but he gives it to me anyway. And that's what salvation is.
amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for the gospel. And this is, we say, we say the word gospel, and that's just a shortened way of saying the, the plan of God through Christ and salvation and forgiveness of sins. We, we talk about the beauty of the gospel, that Jesus Christ came down and bore upon his body the sins. He never sinned, but he took all of our sins upon his body. And what a beautiful story that is, the, the righteous dying for the unrighteous. Jesus Christ never did anything wrong, and yet he died for the sins of the world. He, he took our sins upon him. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for doing that. I pray that there might be one person today that prayed a prayer and asked Jesus into their heart and asked for forgiveness of sins. Father, if there is one individual today that, that got saved, I pray that they would let me know about it. Maybe as they're leaving, I pray that they would just say, I prayed to Jesus today. And what an encouragement that would be because I have, I, I would love to see them grow in you as well. And there are things that they can do to grow in Jesus Christ. So Father, I pray that you would uh, put it upon their heart to let somebody know that they prayed to ask Jesus to save them today. Father, the truth of the matter is, is I understand, I, I don't want to mess up this message. It is so wonderful and it's so true and so free. And I pray that others would receive it. And so I pray, Lord Jesus, today that you would protect us and help us, Father, to be ones that would proclaim the the message of Jesus Christ and what you came here to do, to purge the sins of the world, to offer salvation for us. So, Lord, if you've spoken to someone today and they've accepted you, I pray that we would know about it. Let them know that they need to say something to someone. And I pray that they, this would be the beginning of, of a new part of their life where the foundation walls would go up and a, a beautiful building would be built in the name of Jesus Christ, where they would serve you and honor you the rest of their life. Thank you, Lord, for making it so free and so simple to call upon your name and to believe in you. Thank you, Lord, for the message throughout the word of God, speaking of a coming Christ. And now we understand that this is who we listen to, is Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for Hebrews chapter 1 and for what it means to us. I pray, Lord, that you would bless as we're dismissed here today. Bless these good po folks for being in your house and for listening to the word of God. In Jesus' name, I pray all of these things. Amen. Amen. I want to say God bless you all for being here today. May the Lord bless you. And if you can come at 445 tonight, that would be great. And uh, I pray that you would all grow in Christ. Amen? Amen. God bless you.